What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I'm joined right now by Nick Barashaf, the founder, president, and CEO of Bullion Management Group and the author of $10,000 Gold, Why Gold's Inevitable Rise is the Investor's Safe Haven. Nick, how are you? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to have you on. We haven't had you on the show. Um, and actually, we've never had you at our conferences back in the day when those were legal. Maybe when they are again, we'll have you back because uh, some of our biggest shows are in Toronto, not too far from you. Conferences in the, probably in the mid 90s and so on. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Well, I'm glad to connect and uh, looking forward to this conversation. So I wanted to start with your book because you published $10,000 gold, um, I believe in 2011. That's right. And Time so was great. <laughs> <laughs> timing wasn't great. Yeah. Big correction shortly thereafter. But um, walk us through the thesis. Is it more relevant or less relevant today? And what inspired you to write that book in 2010, 2011? Well, basically, um, I, I was a big believer in gold going up. Like when I started in 1998, my main objective was that there was no um, proper way to hold bullion in a, in a registered account, like RSPs. Um, the only thing available at the time was the central fund. And as a closed-end fund, uh, it, it didn't act like bullion. Uh, normally, uh, gold is um, pretty much negatively correlated to the financial markets. But what happened with a central fund, because it trades on an exchange, when the market's corrected, it would correct by even more. So it totally defeated the purpose of holding bullion in a portfolio. Uh, so I, I went about to, uh, how to how to get that done so that you wouldn't compromise any of the attributes of bullion. And the only way really you could do that would be, and still qualify for registered accounts, was to do an open-end fund. Okay. But in an open-end fund, you first of all ha handle the liquidity problem because you're buying and selling to and from the bullion markets. And then secondly, we, we have a fixed investment policy, so it's always priced at net asset value. There's no premium or discount. There's no fluctuation. There's no human involvement. I purposely set it up without a portfolio manager. But that took four years to do because we needed six exemption from the mutual fund rules. Um, so we finally got it done in 2002. Um, and my philosophy was always that um, every portfolio should have at least 10% in, in physical bullion. And, you know, depends on the conditions that, that could vary. So that, that was the main reason for getting started. In terms of the book, uh, I had really been researching it for probably close to five years. But the main thing I've, I found at the time was that the price of gold in U.S. dollars was correlated to U.S. debt. Okay, and that was the main thesis. I didn't, didn't see how U.S. debt was going to stop growing, but I didn't, didn't uh, plan on COVID. Um, so now the U.S. debt is accelerating even faster. And of course, the, the, the more the U.S. debt goes up, the effectively more money there is in the system, the more the purchasing power goes down, uh, gold's you know, uh, the opposite of that. So uh, unless the U.S. is going to stop borrowing and printing, gold's going to keep going up. And what's the likelihood that the U.S. can stop borrowing and printing at this point? Practically none. <laughs> I mean, we had the 
record amounts in 2020, and we're starting the year with record amounts in the first month. Right, right. So we're, we're playing Under this. the Biden administration, they, uh, both, both, whoever would have won would have had to print more money. But see, uh, there'll be way more uh, printing done, you know, uh, with Biden and, and with Trump. Got it. Okay. Now, you know what, Nick, I, I recently hosted a event on our YouTube channel where we had about 70 one-on-one -on -one interviews, just like this with personalities, just like you. And my intention was to scrape uh, perspective and investment strategies out of as many people as possible. And when you host that many conversations in a short period of time, you can't help but pick up on where there is consensus and where there is still room for debate. And, you know, across the board, uh, everybody that I talked to, had consensus that we are in some shape or version of the logical conclusion of our financial system as we've known it for at least my entire life. That's uh, right. It's it's um, way past any kind of you know historic norms or anything. And we're we're approaching like hyperinflation territory, and and the problem with hyperinflation it starts off slowly and then accelerates very rapidly after a point in time. So do you think we're there? You're in the inflation camp and you think we're, we're there? The, the starting point, and, the, and I, I can't see it slowing down uh, and, and it'll require more and more printing. Like, I mean, the, uh, I, I think it was economically just absolute insanity to shut down the economies. Uh, you know, in the Western world, um, for COVID, you know, quarantine the sick people, and everybody else stays at work like it's always been. Uh, so I think it was a big mistake, and we're not going to bail out of this. The next problem that we're going to run into, um, my my background's in real estate as well, and and the thing is, we've got hotels running at thirteen percent occupancy. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, the, the smaller commercial real uh, retail uh, plazas um, have had significant vacancy. Uh, the office buildings they've sent a lot of the people home, and in many cases aren't aren't going to come back to work. And residential has a eviction moratorium extended to the end of June. Yeah, right. At some point, you're going to start with the landlords defaulting on the mortgages. And that'll make uh, the, the current real estate crash look like, make 208 look like a walk in the park because that was residential. This is commercial. These are multi-million dollar mortgages and yeah, that's going to cause serious problems for the banks. I'm watching that house. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> interesting. So we've been covering that a little bit, actually, and the, the conversation, I guess, has been focused on the likelihood of some sort of an insolvency crisis, right, that would come next, right? We've had right. the liquidity crisis in March, you know, the hope phase where the Fed swoops in and rescues uh, businesses and individuals. And for a while, and the markets have recovered phenomenally well, um, did that surprise you, by the way, Nick, like the V-shaped recovery? No one predicted that back in March. You know, you've been through a few cycles when you saw the aggressive nature of the I Fed. Don't, I don't think it's a V-shaped recovery. I think uh, it's a V-shaped recovery with manipulated statistics. Wow. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Probably, you know, familiar with uh, John Williams of shadow stats is much closer to reality than, sure. than official government statistics. So. Okay. I don't see how you have a V-shaped recovery when there's that many people that aren't working. Y and yeah, yeah. Last year, they printed a whole bunch of money to pay people not to work and had no contribution to GDP. Mm -hmm. So eventually, might be this year, but sooner or later, they're going to have to print that much more money to get the economy back on track. Yeah. No, and I'm with you. And I was referring to the the market recovery, not the economy. That's for sure. And I'm 
you know, we can see how decoupled they become. You, you touched on the response. Uh, well, the market was doing what it was doing because the Fed was printing so much money. Uh, and it and make, makes no economic sense by, by every measure of, of the markets that grossly overvalued. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, just a question of time before they pop. Now, you, you, you touched on your thoughts on the government's response to the pandemic, uh, being a bit reckless. Essentially, we've had a government mandated recession, right? We didn't have a financial crisis. This has been government mandated. Why, what do you think was behind that decision making? Just lack of experience. You've never dealt with a global pandemic before. Was it panic? Uh, you know, it'll, what drove? It'll be a while before we find out if there was any kind of hidden agenda. But a few of the things is that, uh, Apparently, Bill Gates contributed sixty million to the Imperial College in England that did the the models that said two million people in the states were going to die. That panicked say politicians. Then, then the uh, he contributed another two sixty to sixty million to the uh, mainstream media, um, and and then the 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 basic issues are that there is no pandemic that the total death toll in 2020 is no different than to 2019 okay they just reclassified there's there's magically no flu deaths okay so they just reclassified a lot of stuff in the, into covid and the pcr test was the, the guy that invented the pcr test said it was never meant to detect COVID uh, in, in the first place. So it was, they were running it at 40 cycles instead of 20. And, and it was giving 90% false positives. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So who orchestrated all that and why? I don't know. Got it. Um, you know, and, and now the, the next part of the agenda is everybody gets vaccinated with an experimental biological product. It's not a vaccine. Okay, to put it under the vaccine umbrella, it's anything but a vaccine. Would you take the vaccine? No. No. Okay. Chance. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now we 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 touched on a couple of things there. Um, I want to get into uh, your thoughts on the Reddit silver short squeeze and um, talk about that a little bit. Why don't we just go straight to that, therefore? I'm sure you've been watching this closely, really closely, Nick. So give us your perspective, first of all, on what's occurred. Well, you, you can do something like that. Yeah, you've got a, a declining, thinly traded company um, that, that if you get enough people on the, on the bandwagon, clearly the hedge funds would short something like that. Um, you, you could potentially create a short squeeze. There was rumors that same thing was going to happen in silver, uh, but it was would be enormously more difficult to pull that off in silver. Yeah, uh, there, there's multiple markets in, in silver, and there's nowhere close to the transparency that you have in the, in a publicly traded stock. Uh, so you, you, it's hard to determine even, even what what goes on with the the silver ETF. So that was a rumor for a while that that you know just faded away. Uh, but the the underlying fundamentals for for silver is still very strong. Um, where according to the statistics for uh, we're running uh, had a deficit in terms of supply demand, and and it's a good question where ETFs like the SLV are getting the silver from, because unlike gold, you can borrow the gold from the central banks, um, but there isn't any central banks that hold silver, so where are they getting it? Now, silver has a unique kind of supply demand attribute because the 80% of the, the mine supply is a, is a byproduct of other mining. Mm -hmm. So if the silver price goes up to 100 bucks, it, it doesn't 
can't do anything about it from a supply point of view. You're not going to dig up 10 more tons of copper to get a few ounces of silver. Yeah. On, on the demand side, on the, on the uh, industrial side, the amount of silver is used in you know, a lot of electronic applications and so on, but it's a minuscule amount. Like in your cell phone, you're lucky if there's 10 cents in there. So if the price of silver was 10 times, wouldn't make any difference to the price of the cell phone. So that, that's the, the issue. So the, the, the area that can change it quickly is if there's a huge uh, investment demand increase, uh, which, which there can be, and in which case then the, the price will, will skyrocket dramatically, which I think is in, inevitable eventually. Okay, and what will be the key drivers of that supply demand? And it's, it's the same thing. That the, drive, the driver is is the uh, the strength of the U.S. dollar, its ability to maintain its reserve currency status, etc. But you can also have a failure on the comics because you've got uh, a hundred, you know, something like a hundred to one paper ounces to one ounce of silver. So if everybody decided they, they wanted delivery of the futures contracts, COMEX would blow up. Got it. Now, where do you think the SLV is getting their silver? It's hard to say. Like it's, uh, it's got JP Morgan all, all over it. And, and uh, uh, JP Morgan's the custodian for a number of ETFs. But they, they're not the ones responsible for acquiring the silver. Uh, of the, the authorized participants are the ones that contribute either silver or gold to the ETFs. Got it. Got it. Okay, Nick, it's been awesome having you on the show. I'm glad we were able to schedule this in and get you in front of my audience. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. My pleasure.